Ladies and gentlemen, it's a distinct pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Provo City Municipal Council meeting. The time is 5.33. We were met on Tuesday, March 18th, uh, 2014, here in the city center chambers. This meeting is being broadcast live on Provo City Channel 17 and channel17.provo.org where it will also be available for on-demand viewing. The council requests that citizens help maintain the decorum of the meeting by turning off electronic devices, being respectful to council members and others, and refraining from applauding during the proceedings of the meeting, with occasional exceptions. I invite uh, Mr. Parker to begin the roll call. Wayne Parker. John Curtis. Dave Sewell. Gary Winterton. Kim Santiago. Paul Miller. Gary Garrett. Kay Van Buren. Stephen Hales. Brian Jones. Matt Taylor. Thank you. We're delighted to welcome Steve McDaniel, Vice Chair from the Provost neighborhood, who's kindly consented to offer the invocation to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and then to share something about that uh, distinguished neighborhood. Mr. McDaniel. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be here this evening and to conduct this civic meeting. And we pray for thy spirit to attend us and to enlighten our minds and to help us converse in a manner that will bring about good solutions and will be pleasing unto thee and unto us. And we thank thee for the opportunity to exercise our freedom and for the for this nation, which protects our freedoms and those of others around the world. And these blessings we express thanks for in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. I'm really appreciative of this opportunity to have a few minutes with you and, and share the, the, uh, the uh, joy and also the concerns that uh, the Provost neighborhood citizens have with regards to uh, what's going on in their neighborhood and with the, with the city as a whole. Um, there were two items in particular that I would like to bring up and then there, there's a few, few items that I'll just kind of list in order. But uh, the first is this Slate Canyon Trailhead Park. And uh, there's a lot of support in the neighborhood for that. We think it's a very good thing. Uh, we do want to see that there, there is an ongoing funding mechanism for that, we understand that there's, there's been some money set aside to to begin uh, uh, some excavation or, and our other items this year. Uh, but we would like to see that there be something set aside on an ongoing basis, some funds set aside, so that will happen and won't be subject to um, budgeting issues here and there. And uh, and there is another item of concern with that uh, trailhead park uh, with regard to access to the Steve Turley property. As it's understood right now, access to those properties will be through, through the, the parking lots of the trailhead park. And that's the current understanding, if that may or may not be correct. If that's, if that's the case, uh, uh, that doesn't seem quite appropriate. And the uh, second uh, area of, of perhaps largest concern is public transportation. Uh, the neighborhood is very pleased with Front Runner and, and they look forward to the, the BRT, Rapid Transit. But uh, as far as our neighborhood is concerned, we have very little access to the public transportation system. 
it's especially with the new hub things just go north and south of there and we're east of there so we don't see any action and the one thing that could be done is uh, route 822 which is kind of, kind of a uvu byu express route and that last winter i actually took a course up at byu and uh, so i went on that a number of times but it is so packed it is crazy that goes up uh, from Spanish Fork and through Springville up State Street and through our neighborhood and right up to BYU and and it makes very few stops and so it moves rather quickly and it's it's in high demand uh, but there's only three of those buses in the morning and two in the afternoon if that were to be expanded and to be a, a normal route it would it would give our neighborhood much more access to the bus system because currently the the biggest uh, opportunities for transportation use lie with uh, UVU students and with BYU faculty and staff and also retired people who go up to the temple. And that one bus route would, would take care of a, a lot of the needs for, uh, for those different groups. Um, so really we have a kind of a last mile problem because our, our neighborhood is really cut off from the transportation system. And we also, uh, there's a number of people felt that BYU needs to do more in the uh, transportation, to solve the transportation problem. Um, and that has specific reference to the, uh, the route that is selected for the BRT that uh, perhaps BYU could have its, its own, as the University of Utah does, they could have a shuttle that could feed into the BRT system rather than rerouting the BRT system around the campus. Okay, and um, other areas of concern, air pollution. We realize this is not a city, typically a city council kind of a problem, but uh, Utah County suffers from air pollution more so than any other county in the state, so that's our understanding. And uh, so there, there are a lot of concerns about the effects uh, and the linkage between air pollution and things like autism and, and stuff like that. And so from a public health perspective, um, it, it deserves our attention. Other, other uh, suggestions were the electricity turn on. Currently takes too long. It, it, it used to take just a few hours to get electricity turned on, but now it's like a next business day type thing and that was probably done to make it more efficient for the personnel going and turning on the properties but there's no reason it can't be a little bit more frequent than once every 24 hours um, and uh, the wait time on the city phone system is typically like five minutes when you call in and so having personnel that would be maybe doing something else and then be available to answer the phone on an as-needed basis would be very helpful. And also there's a lack of retirement style condos in the, in the city. So um, most of the condos just have a patio in the backyard and that pretty much fills the whole backyard. But uh, if you had uh, more one level living with a, with a little bit bigger backyard, you know, we're talking lots of four, four to 5,000 square feet um, and there are some of those in Orem, but uh, Provo doesn't seem to have any of those type, uh, any of that type of housing. And in conjunction with that, um, there's also been a suggestion, and it fits in with the Trailhead Park issues too, is that we have a, uh, that we would like to take the lead in the city and be the first neighborhood to, to have a master plan that would fit in with the city master plan. So have a neighborhood master plan that would enable the citizens of our neighborhood to actually get in there and, and, uh, and help, help figure out how our area of the city is going to get developed and then, then uh, have a process to fold that into the uh, master plan of the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. I call for a motion to approve the minutes of the council meeting on March 4th, 2014. 
So moved. Thank you, Mr. Winterton. A second. Ms. Santiago. All in favor, please indicate. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. I now turn to Paul Dearden, the manager of the Covey Center, who will introduce the uh, cultural component of our meeting. Council and Mayor, um, thank you for the opportunity once again. Um, it's our pleasure. We, we took the last two months and showed you a little bit of uh, music and theater that's going on in the Covey Center. Um, so we're altering it a little bit tonight. I've invited David Hawkinson, who is the owner of Terra Nova, an art gallery, visual art gallery here in, in downtown Provo, to make a presentation. So I will turn it over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for allowing me to come make this presentation about the, the visual arts. Uh, Terra Nova Gallery uh, began in 2003. And I just make sure, okay, go ahead, next one. It's created to give um, local and emerging artists an opportunity to exhibit their work in a fresh new venue. However, often, when you uh, approach a gallery as an artist and you say, I'd like to be in your gallery, you get this catch-22. Hi, I'd like to be in your gallery. Well, tell me, what galleries have you been in? Well, I haven't been in any. Tell you what, you go get in some galleries, come back and talk to us. It's the same thing, you know, catch-22. How do you get experience until you get experience? Well, Terra Nova uh, was started with the concept behind, fairly simple, that space for original art that with artists that may be not tied to, an, to a specific gallery, but are, should be in a gallery and are ready to hang. They're original works and it, it's, it's for the new, new and upcoming artists. We're located on 300 North at 41 West. And as I said, we've been there for, for over 10 years now. In that time, we have exhibited over 90 different exhibits with approximately 3,000 original works of art, specifically local regional artists for the most part, exhibiting their art in our gallery. Our current exhibit is Reflections by Megan Perry and Playing with Paint by Sus Susan Parkinson. Now, both of these are from UVU. One of them is a student and one of them is, is an instructor. I purposely didn't say which is which because I believe they're both good and they're both ready to hang and should be exhibited. And so this is the opportunity to, to see and buy new art for new artists and help them along and have original art in your home. One of our popular exhibits is our annual plein air painting competition. Artists have from Wednesday morning to register a blank canvas until Friday at noon to then go out, paint within the city limits of Provo, bring it back by noon, and from noon until six, we hang a brand new exhibit of art that's less than 72 hours old. It's a fun challenge. Sometimes um, I've changed it to frigid air Provo because it has snowed on us in October, but it's a, a great opportunity to allow, to showcase the city of Provo. Another fun one is our Great Things Small Packages. This is an open exhibit for any artist. It's not curated, it's not juried, but it has to be 11 by 14 inches or smaller. And so at that time, we filled the gallery with lots of original little art. And they're fun. Another exhibit we've had was Historic Provo. I invited a number of artists and we created art within the city limits of Provo, painting, photography, and showcased some of, some of the, the fine pieces in Provo. Now, not everything is real serious art. We have had dueling banjo pigs which was started by two illustrators on opposite ends of the country, one of them here in Provo and one in Chicago. They both own banjos, 
They both loved to draw. Neither one of them knew how to play, but they always wanted to duel. They started dueling on their blogs by posting an image. Suddenly, someone else said, can I do one? Can I do one? In less than a year, they had over 500 pigs playing banjos on their blogs from people worldwide. We hosted an exhibit of their work. We've even taken artwork outside. We've done sidewalk art for you know, pastel chalk on, on the sidewalk, which is a fun one to, to involve you know, people passing by. Many artists um, never, you know, get to see, you don't get to see a lot of the art. Darrell Thompson, Provo artist here, uh, she works with stone. And she can take a rock and make some phenomenal works of art out of it. Uh, Brian Krasiznik, it's a name maybe you're familiar with. Now he is an artist that is tied to local ga to galleries and as such cannot exhibit within a certain geographic area. However, other galleries will allow him to do small works such as drawings or small pieces. And so as an artist he continues to support my gallery here in Provo with his name and his art. Todd Orchard, local artist from American Fork, created a Kickstarter project. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Got it funded, so he was able to take the time to go down to Moab in the Colorado River area, paint plein air, um, supply his backers with uh, what the agreement was, and then also we held an exhibit of his artwork. Andrew Kosserock works in glass. He is currently working on the 99 most beautiful names of God from the Quran. His depictions of, of what he has read and seen, each of these are titled, and so he's working on this pro multi-year project, and we have exhibited some of his works over the years. Um, James Gunter, another local artist, is, is very much known for his plein air paintings. And he also does studio pastel work. But you can catch him year-round painting outside. Snow, spring, summer, fall, winter. He's out there doing it. Ann Weber from Springville. Mid-70s, still producing art. Wonderful works. She continually comes up brings me new art. Um, Crystal Harper, she's also from American Fork. Young, young artist, she's on her way up. And she has supported the gallery for many years. Ann Gregerson, who is just here, lives down in historic Provo neighborhood, works with ceramics and most of her work is figurative. I'd like to thank you for this time. If you get an opportunity, either check the website, enjoy your bottled signature label, Terranova Water, tonight. And if you get a chance, stop into the gallery sometime. Thank you. Mr. Hawkinson, wonderful presentation. Thank you. And now to Scott Baker, Utility Forester for Provo City, who will present the Employee of the Month Award. Mayor and Council, I'm grateful to be here with you tonight. It's a privilege for me. I had the opportunity uh, this past year with one of my other employees uh, to al also extend an Employee of the Month and an Employee of the Year Award from the Forestry Division. And so I think we've been well represented and, and very proud of, of these um, employees that I get the opportunity to rub shoulders with on a, on a daily basis and get an opportunity again tonight to, to share with you about another quality individual that I've had the opportunity to know now for for 19 years. I, When I started working with Provo not too long after that one of the first hires that I was involved with was was with Mr. Lance Clark and he has been selected as the March uh, 2014 Employee of the Month for the City of Provo 
and I wanted to introduce you to him today. As 19 years ago, Lance started out first as a groundsman in the forestry division and has worked his way up for attaining the proper credentials and certifications and training to become a foreman and has become one of our most valued and diligent foremen. And I just wanted to share with you today uh, a quote that, that was received by the mayor's office just last week from a citizen uh, that had interactions with Lance and his crews. He said, they are the very best guys in the world. They are incredibly respectful, responsible, amazingly kind, professional, very skilled, proficient, respectful of others' property, and they have done an absolutely wonderful job. And I think this is very indicative, not only of Lance, but those that work on his crews and those that work with him in the forestry division. Um, he is a very hardworking employee, and, and if there's just a couple of words that I would use to describe Lance, one would be hardworking. I have never, ever had any issues with Lance when it comes to productivity. He is one of the most hardworking employees that I've ever had, and when he's given an assignment, he does it. He does it well, and he does it very proficiently. Um, the other one is dependable. Lance is always very dependable. Not, does he, not only does he just show up on time, as he's supposed to, and clock in and out, but I know I can count on him to do any job from the smallest to the most difficult, whether it's on the clock, during a work day, or if it's a very extreme outage situation, or we have a lot of power outages because the trees are down on lines, Lance is always there. Um, just over a year ago, we had the great opportunity to be invited to Bountiful. Um, you might remember their huge windstorm that they had go through that city, and Lance was one of those that responded to that outage and that, that I incident. And we heard nothing but great compliments from the citizens and from the employees and from the administration from Bountiful City because of the hard work that they did in that city as well. And that's just a small taste of what I get to work with on a daily basis. But I want to present to you as the March 2014 Employee of the Month, Lance Clark. With Lance, we just want to congratulate you, tell you thank you very much for the hard work, and thank you for representing Provo. Your special friend up. <laughs> Lance is very fortunate. Um, she is by his side all the time, and is a great strength to him, and as we know, he's only as good as he is probably because of her. And so thank you very much for supporting him. <laughs> Customarily, this is a photo op, so we'll ask you to come back up. Time has been set aside for the public comment segment of this meeting, providing an opportunity for anyone in attendance to address the council and administration. However, please be aware that there are several more effective ways of doing so, including direct contact with council members and members of the administration through email, by telephone, or by social media. A list of contact information is readily available in a handout at the back of the room and also available at the city website, provo.org. Often many requests can be dealt with by telephoning 311. Anyone who wishes to speak should do so courteously and civilly. 
To do otherwise may result in a request to desist. Please speak briefly so as to allow similar opportunity to others. Please be aware that the Council and Administration cannot take any formal action on matters that arise during the public comment segment. They may respond informally as appropriate. When invited by the recorder, please state your name and city of residence into the microphone. We invite anyone who wishes to speak to, to uh, issues that uh, will not be accompanied by public comment uh, later in the agenda to do so now. Item three, a public hearing on consolidation of annexation petitions for the Smith Northern Hill annexation, northern and southern portions, containing a total of approximately 210 acres of real property, generally located between 5,000 and 5,500 north on the east side of Canyon Road and extending eastward to include all unincorporated areas of Utah County, located in section seven and 18 of T6S, R3E, SLV and M the North, uh, north uh, Timview and River Bottoms neighborhoods. Uh, Mr. Brian Maxfield. Thank you. Uh, this item uh, is the annexation of approximately 200 acres uh, in this area of the city. Uh, through discussions with the property owners, we have agreement from all uh, two annex except for the uh, Roger Gillespie property. Uh, there were items brought up at the study session which uh, discussed the need for development agreements in this area to be signed uh, by the property owners and uh, I believe through your discussion, you look to continue this item to a, a future meeting. In fact, I call for a motion, please. Mr. Jones. Mr. Chair, I believe that during the work session, this was already moved to the April 15th meeting by motion, so I don't think a motion is necessary now. Thank you. Item four, a public hearing on a resolution adding chapter 11 bicycle plan to the transportation master plan and adopting the Provo Bicycle Master Plan as the legislative policy intent and priority of the Municipal Council. Ryan Harvey. Thank you, members of council, mayor. Um, we've been over this quite a few times and you've heard from me uh, probably four or five times over the last several months. So I'm not gonna speak that much. We did invite a couple um, guest speakers to come and uh, speak about the process. So. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview and then I'll turn the time uh, to them. Um, just a very, very um, brief timeline. Uh, you can see there, November of 2011 is when the committee was organized. Um, from October to January, we had public meetings, uh, an online survey input from, from the public. Um, May 2012 is when uh, some council members and members of staff uh, took a trip to Boulder, Colorado to kind of put their mind around um, this and, and uh, a city that, that um, has done a very good job uh, with these kind of uh, infrastructure. Um, 2012 and 2013, uh, the consultant um, wrote the plan uh, with input from the committee and then since September of 2013, it's been reviewed by the TMAC, by the Planning Commission, by the Council, back to the TMAC and, and to the Council again. Um, and so uh, we'll, uh, we'll have some guest speakers talk about that. Um, one of the things I just wanted to make clear um, about what it is that you're doing, there's two actions uh, that are a part um, of this uh, resolution. The first is that you're adopting the Bicycle Master Plan. And, and the title, the official title is the Technical Report for the Bicycle Master Plan. Um, and so you're adopting that uh, as a policy document. Uh, of the Municipal Council. Um, the second thing is that you're amending the Transportation Master Plan uh, to include a summary of the technical report for the Bicycle Master Plan. And so um, that's kind of what we reviewed last week uh, or two weeks ago in the work session. Um, and so those are the two actions that, that are on the table today. And um, as, as we talk about the implementation of the plan, one of the things you know, as you adopt the Bicycle Master Plan as a policy document, that doesn't mean that you're adopting everything in there. It's not, it's, you're not um, uh, saying that you're gonna do everything that's in the plan. 
um, or that you're bound uh, by what's in the plan, um, but rather as a guiding uh, policy document. And Dave Graves is going to talk a little bit more uh, about what that means from engineering's point of view. Uh, as uh, council staff researched um, the policies, uh, stated policies of the council, um, we found the, the bicycle master plan to be consistent with um, policies found in the transportation master plan, the general plan, uh, and Vision 2030. So now I'll uh, turn, turn some time over to some of our guest speakers. Um, first we'll hear from uh, Aaron Skabelund. Uh, forgive me if I pronounce that incorrectly. Uh, he's from the Provo Bicycle Committee, and they had a, a very uh, large um, impact on what, uh, on how the the plan was was formed, what went into the plan. So he'll kind of talk about that. Um, David Harding, if he uh, um, is here, okay, he is here. Good. Uh, he he's from the Transportation and Mobility Advisory Committee, TMAC. He'll talk a little bit about how they reviewed the plan, the meetings that they went through. And then Dave Graves uh, uh, from our engineering department will talk a little bit about the implementation of the plan. Uh, and each of them uh, will take about five minutes each. So I'll turn the time over to uh, Aaron. Thank you, Ryan. Um, as was mentioned, I am the chair of the uh, Provo Bicycle Committee, and I am also an assistant chair of the River Grove neighborhood. I'm very grateful for uh, this invitation from Council Chair Hal Miller to talk about the role of the Provo Bicycle Committee in the formulation of this bicycle master plan. This is a banner day for bicycling here in Provo. This afternoon, I attended a meeting where the BYU administration announced that it would be implementing almost every single element of its campus bicycle master plan as it completes the campus unification plan. And tonight, we celebrate an important step in improving the quality of life of our city. Yet, my heart is heavy. As some of you may know, this last week, our community lost one of its most active members in Andrew Ungerman. Since Zach Whitmore and I reestablished the Provo Bicycle Committee back in 2009, after it had been dormant for a number of years, Andrew was a quiet but committed member of the committee, one of the most consistent volunteers at the Provo Bicycle Collective, and a visible and was visible year-round, riding back and forth to UVU, to UVU, where he was a student. One of my fondest memories of Andrew is decorating cookies with him and Zach in my kitchen in preparation for a ride celebrating the reopening of the Provo River Trail two years ago, a ride with, in with, that the mayor and several council members joined. Tonight, we will gather as a bicycling community at the courthouse at 6.30 and participate in another ride, a ride of silence in memory of Andrew. In many, in many ways, Andrew represented what the Provo Bicycle Committee is all about. Respect for all road users, a healthy environment, an active lifestyle, family and friends, quality of life, safety, and most of all, community. The Provo Bicycle the, the Provo Bicycle Plan is a document that can transform our community by making all, but by making our streets truly public roads and complete streets, welcoming and safe for users of all modes of transportation, drivers, bus riders, pedestrians, runners, and yes, bicyclists. The plan is the product of many years of work and collaboration. The city's engineering department deserves immense credit. Years ago, working with an early iteration of the Provo Bicycle Committee, engineering had the foresight to create a number of bike lanes throughout the city. Such forward thinking provides Provo with a solid foundation to do something great. We are blessed in Provo to have the 15-mile-long Provo River Trail, the most popular amenity in our wonderful park system. It is a community treasure that connects residents with the river, with our mountains, with our parks, our workplaces, our schools, 
and our history. I commend those who allocated the funds necessary to build the parkway and the Parks Department, which does an excellent job maintaining this bike ped path. I'd like to thank Mayor Curtis, who has been immensely supportive since Zach and I met with him in early 2010, and he immediately recognized our committee as the Mayor's Provo Bicycle Committee. He leads by example, and it has been wonderful to see his commitment to ride to work 100 days both last year and again this year. I am pleased that he will be offering the closing keynote speech with Mayor Caldwell of Ogden at the Provo Bike Summit next month in Salt Lake. The Engineering Department and the, the Bike Committee will also be presenting about our progress in making Provo a more bicycle-friendly community. I'd like to invite all members of the Council to join us at this summit on, February, on uh, April 25th. Bike Utah has indicated that they will likely hold the summit in Provo next year. The Bicycle Master Plan was made possible in part thanks to Mountain Land, the Mountain Land Association of Governments, a stakeholder committee composed of representatives from MAG, UDOT, UTA, BYU, the City Council, several city departments, and one representative from the Bike Committee, committee uh, met for over a year to hammer out this plan. The final technical document was prepared by one of the premier bicycle planning agencies, Alta Planning and Design, whose lead consultant, Travis Jensen, is a graduate of BYU's engineering program and was the chair of the earlier Provo Bicycle Committee. Several public meetings were held, and according to Casey Sear, public involvement and input were extraordinarily high. So too was the involvement and support of the council. During the formulation of the plan, the council and some members of the administration traveled to Boulder, as has been mentioned. And they had a first-hand look uh, at a world-class bicycle and pedestrian network of over 100 miles of multi-use uh, pathways. We appreciate the council's support of our efforts to make our community more livable, more family-friendly, and our roads safe for all users. Recent tragic accidents over the past year involving bicyclists and pedestrians remind us that there is much work to do. As we as, we as a community create an internet, interconnected network of bikeways and a culture that make it safer to bicycle, people, both young and old, will ride in Provo, and Provo will be a healthier, happier, and more livable community. Thank you. Good evening, council members. I was asked to uh, characterize the discussions that the uh, Transportation and Mobility Committee uh, Advisory Committee uh, held. Uh, we met four times, roughly seven hours, to discuss the Bicycle Master Plan, and I will try to give you the essence of those discussions in five minutes. The original Bicycle Master Plan was created by a steering committee which included three representatives from Provo City Engineering, two representatives each from Economic Development, Community Development, and UDOT, and a single representative from the Police Department, Streets, Parks and Rec, Information Systems, Council, City Council, Provo School District, UTA, MAG, BYU, and the Provo Bicycle Committee. That uh, Bicycle Master Plan is now referred to as the Bicycle Master Plan Technical Report and is proposed to be included as Appendix C in the Provo City Transportation Master Plan. A new Chapter 11 is proposed for the Transportation Master Plan and summarizes the original plan and qualifies the City's commitment to implement that plan. Based on engineering's, uh, Engineering Department's role in developing the original plan, I was surprised at the first meeting when they took a fairly reluctant position towards the original plan. Engineering characterized the plan as being written by the bicycle people and therefore was not totally realistic and didn't weigh all the considerations that the engineering department must consider. Engineering was concerned that the adopted plan would limit their flexibility to address overall transportation challenges. The engineering department uh, may not have felt like all of their concerns were reflected in the technical report, but they definitely held sway in the creation of Chapter 11. They wrote, wrote each draft and were the only entity presenting and answering questions in our committee meetings. <clears throat> this can be seen in the different tones between Chapter 11 and the technical report, 
where the technical report is fairly upbeat, Chapter 11 repeatedly enumerates the reasons why the plan may not be fully uh, implemented. Despite this, it is my impression that the current arrangement with Chapter 11 in the Transportation Master Plan and the technical report as Appendix C is acceptable to all of the interested parties. There are three areas of TMAC discussion I want to touch on. First, how should the Bicycle Master Plan be folded into the Transportation Master Plan? We, agree, we agreed with the engineering department that the full technical report did not fit in the style or scope of the rest of the transportation master plan and supported the creation of a separate chapter 11 that references the technical report. In fact, we felt that the first draft of chapter 11 needed to better match the rest of the transportation master plan. Chapter 11 went through several drafts during the five months that TMAC was considering the bicycle master plan. Second, there was discussion about how binding the plan would be if it was adopted. Uh, this was sparked by engineering's concern that the plan would limit their flexibility. The technical re report identifies almost 150 projects, and they are listed in Chapter 11. It isn't re realistic to think that the adoption of the plan is a commitment to build all 150 projects exactly as expressed in the plan. The Bicycle Master Plan articulates a vision and suggests a direction forward. It would be adopted as legislative intent, policy, and priority of the council with the understanding that the details of the implementation may vary. Third, the criteria for phasing, the phasing of the projects was somewhat ambiguous, which caused some discussion. One line in chapter 11 states that the phases are based on the feasibility, cost, and anticipated uh, completion time frame of the proposed uh, improvements but the phases are labeled short-term, medium-term, and long-term, suggesting that the time frame is the most important. The descriptions of the phases make it clear that coordination and synchronization with planned street modifications is also important. When implementing the plan, periodic consideration should be given to all the projects um, in case the timing is optimal for a later phase project to be built earlier than expected. The Transportation and Mobility Advisory Committee feels that the proposed Chapter 11 with the reference technical report represents a valuable addition to Provo City's Transportation Master Plan and recommends its adoption by the Council. Thank you. Mr. Harding, thank you. Mr. Graves. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come and address the Council this evening. Uh, we, we have, have been at this process of our bicycle master plan uh, for, for several years now. Glad to see us be able to get to this point in this process. I want to just uh, share with you, and I'm, I'm sure those who have viewed the document, uh, this will be a familiar statement, but this is a vision statement contained within our, our uh, ch uh, Chapter 11 of the uh, proposed bicycle master plan. It says, Provo City will create strong families, vibrant neighborhoods, and a healthy community through the promotion and accommodation of bicycling as a vital means of everyday transportation and recreation. As I talk about uh, the implement implementation of this plan, I think that vision statement, in essence, wraps up what we intend to do as we move forward with the implementation of, these pl of this plan. Uh, there are several parts uh, that will, uh, you know, be important as, as we look at how do we implement this. Uh, as uh, was mentioned previously, there's, there's uh, roughly 150 projects that have been identified as important elements uh, to the bicycling uh, network throughout the city. And accommodating all of, all of those uh, projects and needs Will, will be a, a big task for us to look forward to. Um, it was mentioned also that uh, the projects have, have been broken down into short-term, medium-term, long-term, uh, representing essentially uh, different uh, phasing plans or, or the ability to break these down into projects that may be easily, more easily accomplished kind of in the middle and then ones that are a little bit more difficult. But as, as we look forward to the implementation of the plan, we will not be uh, just looking at those projects that are easiest to accomplish and, and most quickly accomplished, but we'll be looking at that entire list. Uh, this uh, will be accomplished uh, partially as we go through the budget process each year to evaluate and identify funding availability 
uh, four projects that are contained within this list. We'll also be reviewing all of our capital improvement projects, uh, you know, for roads and other, other transportation modes through the city and look at those projects and see how we can incorporate uh, bikeway projects within, within the scopes of those projects. Uh, another important aspect that we'll be looking at will be to review uh, accident data and look at safety concerns associated with uh, bicycling and bicycle routes throughout the city and ways that we can help to improve uh, spot improvements or those areas that, that we're, we're seeing problems uh, with accidents. Uh, another area that uh, we will be focusing on is, is looking to increase the connect of bicycle lanes and uh, separated bicycle trails throughout the city. Many of those are disconnected and, and need to be connected up so that we can can have that uh, continuity for that uh, mode of transportation throughout the city. Uh, this process, uh, we see this occurring, as I mentioned, on an annual basis. We'll be coordinating with the uh, Transportation Mobility Advisory Committee, who have been a great resource uh, to us as we have brought this uh, document to completion. Uh, their input has, has been uh, very important uh, to us. We'll be working with the administration. We'll be working with the city council to to uh, bring projects uh, that will help accomplish the goals of our, our bicycle master plan. And in uh, conjunction with that, we'll also be looking at other funding opportunities that may exist out there for us to be able to complete these projects on this plan. And so that's... Uh, you know, kind of in a nutshell, the, the plan for implementation of this project or uh, bicycle master plan. We're excited uh, to move forward with, with the adoption of this plan and uh, hope the council supports us in that effort. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Would you remain, please, uh, here? May I commend you, Mr. Scavell, and Mr. Harding for excellent uh, presentations. Thank you. Are there questions uh, from members of the council? for Mr. Graves. Thank you. Mr. Harvey. Uh, that was all I had, unless you have any further questions. Thank you. Are there any? I will know on uh, Dave Graves' point about reviewing it every year, that is part of the resolution. I believe part three of the resolution is that um, it will be reviewed annually as part of the CIP and city budget. So. Reviewed by the uh, Municipal Council? Yes. Yes. Thank you. This is a resolution and therefore does not require public hearing. However, I invite anyone forward who wishes to speak against the Bicycle Master Plan. Randy Farland, a Provo resident. Um, I'm all for bicycling. I have a bicycle and I enjoy biking. I just have a concern uh, for private property rights. The way I understand this, uh, it's, it's a broad definition of, of um, uh, a situation that could be made safer. Uh, that, uh, through eminent domain, people's private property could be taken to accommodate uh, bicycle trails. And um, I think that the council's intent and priority should be to protect uh, property rights, uh, at, at least uh, have that as a high priority when considering uh, any legislation or uh, policies. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there others? I invite uh, conversation by the council. Mr. Winterton. Yes, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. The, I appreciate, especially over the last few months, uh, the bicycle committee and engineering and other city people working together to 
overcome some concerns that were expressed over the last few months. I am very impressed with the way you've been able to go forward. I'm grateful for that. I had the opportunity to go to Boulder with the group and to experience that. I know they have some beautiful trails and they're expensive too. And I'm grateful for the way that we're as a community can come together and say, maybe we can't afford completely that, but this is something we can shoot for. And, we, and, and the recognition that we need to work together to accomplish what we hope for. And I'm grateful for that because there are challenges financially, but we do want to do it as, as good as we can. I'm grateful for um, Aaron and heading up that committee. They did an, an amazing job. Maybe, and I, you don't like to say this, but maybe just too good, is that you kept, you, and, I, and I hope you'll hold our feet to the fire and yet be patient at the same time, which is also a challenge, and I am grateful for that. And I hope that you'll do, be able to exercise both of those virtues. Um, also, I think now it would be an appropriate time to give it just a quick shout out to Mr. Beck, former member of the council, who worked hard on, on um, the bicycle master plan for our city in conjunction with the group, and um, I'm grateful for his efforts. We kind of ribbed him once in a while, but we are grateful for his efforts as this comes to fruition. Thank you. Mr. Sewell. Maybe just add a shout out to his wife, who's here, yes. who I think had uh, a lot to do with this as well. <laughs> Other comments? Ms. Santiago. I'd just like to say thank you to the committees that were involved, from the bike committee, to the steering committee, to TMAC who reviewed it, to the planning commission who also gave recommendation, and um, all those who had input on this. As you look, I don't know if we have access to the maps, but the, the map as it is now, you look at these trails, as Mr. Graves mentioned, and they're very disjointed. They're, they're not complete trails. We have the Provo River Trail, which, which is wonderful. I just took that on Friday. Um, Aaron mentioned, I told him I was kind of a wimp for the weather, so I hadn't been out on my bike. And he said, well, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad equipment. Is that right? Is that the quote? So I <laughs> got myself some good equipment, and it was really lovely. So, um, But I, I think this is a great plan to, to uh, make our streets complete, I think, to make our streets more walkable, more bikeable, and I think that will help create or enhance what we already have in Provo. We, we have a very unique community, we're, we're close-knit, we know our neighbors, and I think having streets that are walkable and bikeable encourages that as well. It gets people out of their homes, it gets them out of their cars, it, it just it increases that community feel. And I, I really like that part of it. I, I don't know how much it contributes to air quality. It, apparently less than 1% is what the, the information that I have most. Um, but it's a start. And I, uh, I appreciate all the effort that has gone into this and just wanted to say that. So. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Hales. I do appreciate all the work that's gone into this for many years. Uh, it's involved a lot of people. I'm grateful that we're able now to review it after having had these different participant groups from the city take a look at it. Uh, somebody who's had a family member hit on his bicycle while he was riding legally on the street, I'm very appreciative of the fact that this plan will hopefully make it so that uh, not only the bicyclists are safer, but the people who drive in Provo are more aware of bicycling and what it means to share the road. Uh, so, once again, I, I just echo the comments that have been made, appreciation for everyone who's been involved so far. Thank you. I invite a motion to approve the resolution. I would like to make a motion to approve the resolution. And uh, actually, if I could just make one comment along the way as well in regard to Mr. Farland's comment. My understanding is that this resolution is not authorizing in advance any uh, any any type of uh, eminent domain proceeding, and that any any thing like that was that was necessary would be handled on a case by case basis as as this progresses. So, with that, I'm going to approve. Mr. Jones, I'd like to second. 
response? I concur with everything Mr. Sewell said. Mr. Hales. Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, please. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We now turn to another pair of resolutions. The first on an appropriation of seventy thousand uh, dollars in the uh, by the municipal council from the general fund for professional services related to contracting with a third-party engineering firm to develop an independent second opinion of an optional bus rapid transit route for Provo City, based on Federal Transportation Administration (FTA) funding criteria, including an evaluation of ridership estimates based on current model and on current conditions and applying to the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2014. The next re separate resolution approves a contract for transportation engineering consulting services to Hales Engineering, LLC, in the amount of $95,000 and applying to fiscal year ending June 30th, 2014. I invite Mr. Taylor to uh, address both resolutions, or rather Mr. Harvey, uh, though we'll treat each of them separately. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead here. Um, so you, it, it may be a little confusing that we're appropriating $70,000 and then approving a contract for $95,000. Mr. Um, Harvey, if I may jump in right at that moment. Um, there, that discrepancy was because of the noticing requirement that we had a 10-day no notice and we had to publish that two weeks ago. Um, at the time, that was our understanding of the council's intent. Um, this contract is different. There was an opinion made by the administration that I didn't feel it was a conflict for you to actually approve the full 95000 tonight. And so if that is desired, uh, you may amend the motion to uh, approve the item with the 95000 So just to clarify where we're headed with that. Thank you. Um, so, so that's uh, item number five. Um, so you can amend that and, and uh, I guess uh, approve it for ninety-five thousand. Um, as, as far as item number six goes, uh, just briefly, um, we uh, reviewed reviewed the contract. If you saw the RFP at the back of the RFP, there was a contract that Hell's Engineering uh, provided um, our legal department. Um, uh, Brian Jones, uh, as well as um, Robert West, uh, reviewed that and made some suggested changes. Uh, I spoke with Hell's Engineering earlier today, and they were okay with those changes. What you have in front of you is the, the final uh, contract that Hell's Engineering, that Ryan Hell's has agreed to. Um, he wishes he could have been here tonight, but he had a, a prior engagement he had to go to. Um, but uh, so, so uh, what you have in front of you, he has agreed to. And um, um, uh, unless you have any further questions, that's all I had. Mr. Harvey, are you aware of the letter that uh, was placed before us earlier in this meeting from W. Steve Meyer, the Chief Capital Development Officer of UTA? I'm not. Ms. Weiss, do you have a copy of that letter? Mr. Taylor, would you please give that copy to Ms. Weiss, and I will ask you please to read the bolded statements, one through four, from this uh, letter from Mr. Meyer. Okay, um, statement number one. The study proposes to continue to spend time and money evaluating alternatives that are clearly unacceptable to UTA. In item number two, the study does not propose to evaluate alternate four or the locally preferred alternative from the draft environmental assessment. Number three, the consultants don't understand the implications of circulators to the cost of the overall UTA transit system. And number four, the consultants do have experience with the Federal Transit Administration's small starts process and criteria. Mr. Chair, if I could, one clarification, just for the sake of the record, having read the letter, I'm fairly certain that that last one is a typo and it's supposed to say do not have experience. Yeah, that would be consistent with what follows. Oh, because if you read further, it says the consultant team selected has no experience in the small starts process. Correct. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Jones, for pointing that out. And would you make sure that this letter is appended uh, to the minutes? Thank you. 
I, uh, <clears throat> 12 minutes are designated for comment on this matter from the public. If you have something to uh, say to either or both uh, of these resolutions, kindly do so now. Uh, Dave Connect, Provo. Um, I listened to the letter and I just wonder if there's anyone out there that would get their recommendation or if every consultant that you might possibly consider would get the same evaluation from UTA. Um, so I'm not sure what to make of the letter. Uh, I, I think getting a second opinion is a good idea, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. My name's Greg Duerden. <clears throat> I live up in the Tree Streets, that wealthy neighborhood. Uh, there's really a lot of people on fixed incomes up there, so I don't know where that wealthy idea came. But regarding the resolution, I'm a very conservative individual, um, but I don't see a problem with uh, using less than one-tenth of one percent of the budget, a budgeted item for uh, BRT to get a second opinion. More information can only add light to this uh, plan uh, and the, the previous plan, UTA's plan, um, I feel was really based on faulty planning assumptions uh, and is is now out of date so we need an update for the plan thank you thank you Ben Markham 801-374-3252 but none of you ever call me <laughs> That's not that true. Again, uh... Dave Sewell calls me. I, I want to make a comment that, I, that I've made to a few of you personally. My concern is there's no resolution amongst you on what constitutes a significant finding from this study. I feel like this is the classic case, if you don't know where you're going, anywhere you go is okay. Uh, I really think there needs to be some kind of... Um, discussion amongst the council to decide what constitutes a significant finding. There's been a lot of contention and a lot of discussion. Two points that I will make. I believe there's been a lot of cherry picking of data on both sides. You find an element that supports the argument that you're making and it gets pulled out of context. I also believe that um, no matter what comes out of this study in the current situation. Some of you will decide it supports the original plan and some will decide it doesn't. And the contention will continue. We need to get rid of the contention. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Rohn, I'm also a Provo resident. Um, first of all, I wanted to, and it's good that you're all sitting down, I wanted to thank those members of the, the City Council and the Mayor and his staff who've made themselves so available. Uh, the past couple of days in particular to meet with individual citizens to discuss this issue and a number of others as well and have been open to um, two-way communication. That said, I have some concerns about the process and what I see happening with the council as it relates to this item and how it becomes applied in a broader sense in the future. I agree with Mr. Markham. I really think that if we don't understand or have defined criteria by which to evaluate the uh, study that's being done that we really have no way to to determine the value or how to make a decision if we for example find out that the evaluation comes down to the difference of of a dime per rider per mile or whatever whatever that number was that was mentioned before I don't know if a dime is significant on five dollars and ten cents or if it's inconsequential and I think we have to define the parameters by which we're going to evaluate the study up front. I know of no scientific type study 
that doesn't have some sort of a criteria to evaluate the data they get back. Second of all, I'm very concerned. I understand the city went out for, for bids. Somewhere eight or ten requests were made, and we got back two. One was a fairly extensive bid, and one was, I think, very um, simple. And I'm concerned because I don't think that the applicants who responded to the bid had equal footing in which to um, reply or to provide their, uh, their bid. That concerns me greatly, uh, and I think that, that our sunshine laws require that we do everything in an open forum so that all participants are given equal footing in the bidding or participation process. I'm also concerned over the fact that the numbers increased by about 40% from the prior general uh, meeting where we were discussing cost factors, uh, and that happened in the bidding process. That's a concern to me that we have such a wide swing in, uh, in looking at these things when we thought we had fairly firm numbers before. I think that the general procedure that we have for these sorts of things is something that the council needs to follow. And if new council members aren't aware of the procedure in which things happen, we need to engage the staff far more, uh, far earlier and far more proactively in helping the council uh, follow these procedures to protect you as individuals, us as a city, to move forward. And I'm, I'm very, very concerned over the precedent that this seems to be setting that we can create an emergency or we can do this or we can do that and we don't have to follow procedures. I think that's very scary and um, is indicative of potential significant issues over time. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Laurie Urquiaga and I'm a resident of Provo. Um, and I'd like to thank the council for the depth of consideration that you've been putting on this matter. I think that that's really a valuable um, experience that we've all gone through. Um, $95,000 is a lot of money, um, and I don't think any of us dispute that. Um, however, in the context of a $120 million project, I don't think it's exorbitant. Um, my recollection from two weeks ago is that the range was seventy dollars to $90,000, so 95 is not that far away. Um, as somebody who's been looking at this issue, I don't want to think that I've been doubting the experts, but I've been kind of questioning whether or not the data gathered by the experts before BYU made changes to their plans really applied now. And so for me, as somebody who lives in the Tree Streets area, it would be very helpful to know that the data that UTA has is correct um, and that we're moving forward with the best possible plan. Um, and I don't think UTA should feel threatened by this process because if their data really is good, it should support their conclusions. So I feel like this would be money very well spent and I think that my neighborhood would appreciate knowing that there was a second opinion that confirmed what UTA has been saying. Thank you. Thank you. Ross Story and uh, thank you Council and Mayor for the chance to to have comment, I also just, I really am grateful for the effort that you put into this. It's amazing how much time you have spent personally on the issue of BRT and who knows how uh, maybe heart-wrenching it might be, I don't know. Um, so just thank you. And um, uh, some of the things I was going to say was were just said, so I don't know if, I'll just repeat the, the bullet points. but. Um, BYU has made some significant changes. Um, and, and even Ninth East is different now. Uh, just the landscape of it has changed recently as well. Um, so I support, I support getting a second opinion. I do like the points that were made about making sure we understand what we give weight to, uh, what's important, what constitutes a significant change. I think that that's important in any decision-making process you want to figure out what things, what elements bear the most weight for you. For some, it may be ridership. For others, it may be um, construction of commercial projects. So I think as a city, it's important to decide what things carry the most weight in our community, and then we can evaluate appropriately. Um, one thought that goes back to my, my gratitude for you on, on taking this matter and studying it out, 
Uh, there have been a few comments about um, trusting the experts and, and maybe even who are we to question the experts and I thought that's what, what the council's and the citizens' job was. Um, you have experts here at the pulpit consistently giving you data and telling you things that they've studied out and want, they want money for or whatever and part of the process of good government is the citizens and the, the council, those in leadership, they, they study it out enough to feel comfortable enough to vote. Um, if, if, you don't feel, if you don't understand the issue enough to vote, then you shouldn't be voting is, is just the way that I kind of look at it. So I applaud those of you or all of you who have kind of taken the expert hat and tried to put it on and see if it fits. And I applaud your efforts in trying to understand the issue. I think it's well worth our time considering the, the enormity of the project, both its impact now and the cost uh, to the community around us and the cost to the nation. So I, I think this is a valuable process we're going through. It's a little painful, but I'm grateful for it. And uh, I hope that all those comments were clear. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gustafson, you'll be our concluding speaker. Mr. Gustafson will be the concluding speaker. I said we would allow 12 minutes. So we're attempting to make fact-based decisions. And that's really difficult to do when they're intangibles, like neighborhoods, which can be at an end in and of itself, but hard to measure any kind of social criteria easily. But the facts that we have have problems with them. Uh, there are a number of facts underlying so forming the basic premise of the UTA's position. I think that these facts, but for them coming from a separate organization, namely MAG, would be the basis, the, the misrepresentation or the inaccuracy of these facts being the basis for a decision to go forward on something like this and a representation of the federal government would be a basis for a legal claim, again, but for the separate separation where UTA can say, we were simply relying on the data of a separate body. The, those facts that are basic to this have real accuracy problems. But we're encouraged to rely on a system that has a for-profit entity with $150 million at stake, with high paid salaries at stake, and in the light of what we've just experienced with John Swallow, with Richard Rawl, with our wards, our communities, people we know, the power of that money, we need to at least know that the people that are advocating this have had a second check, have had a judicial check, that these couple of facts that have been called into dispute many times that I think would be the basis for a lawsuit, but for the separation that UTA can disavow their source, um, aren't indicative that other people are looking to profit. I recently found out that UTA, in addition to being a for-profit, also has a probe development initiative, which would encourage them to look for cheaper land, places that they can purchase more easily to develop. So that makes the poorer among us more susceptible. And it encourages people who have friends, realtors, etc., cetera, to to form relationships that can be profitable just as friends or as part of climbing up political ladders. These things are really big concerns because we're talking about a neighborhood here. So if we can avoid these kinds of gray areas, eliminate the problems that have come here in Utah County, here in our area, and are the source of daily headlines, um, then that would be fantastic. And right now, I believe when we've got a for-profit advocating on a pro-development path, and we have the opportunity to look at excellent reviews, th this is just a fantastic opportunity to eliminate those and to receive assurances that we won't be making profit off of the loss of a neighborhood for ourselves. But this really is for the general good. Thank you. Thank you. I invite conversation by the council.
Mr. Sewell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we're going to have a bus rapid transit system in Provo uh, very soon. And my belief is that that is going to happen regardless of which way the vote goes tonight. So I don't believe that that is what this vote is about. I would also like to preface my uh, comments about how I intend to vote by saying that uh, this has been an extraordinary experience this last couple of months. And regardless of, of uh, how long I'm serving in this position, it has been a privilege. And I've learned from it. And I am determined to improve the communication flow between you as residents and the council. And we're already starting to do that, and we have more ideas in that regard. I intend to vote uh, to pass the resolution for the second opinion, and I'd like to explain why. I have four reasons. First is out of respect for our form of government and for my council colleagues. We have had two votes related to this in recent weeks. Uh, the majority voted to, to uh, do a second opinion, and the majority voted to select a contractor. Unless I had a very, very good reason, I believe I should sustain those votes and vote to authorize the funds so that uh, the intent of those previous resolutions should, could be carried out. That's reason number one. Reason number two is, to me, a matter of um, integrity or keeping agreements. Let me just tell you a little bit about how we got to this point where we are talking about this second opinion. Um, I believe it was uh, Councilwoman Santiago that came up with the idea first, to the best of my recollection. And when she started talking about it, it immediately resonated with me and with a number of other council members. My best recollection of the process is that there was very strong support for the concept on the council and from the mayor. And uh, we proceeded on, on that basis. Um, the idea was that there would be a pair of resolutions that would allow BRT to move forward, sort of a, a reasonable compromise, where um, the concerns of what I believe to be a min minority, but when I say that, I'm talking about much broader minority than just people living in the Tree Streets area, but were concerns of a minority that were concerned about impacts, questions of data validity, data currency, those kind of things, and I, I would include myself in, as one who had those concerns, where, where those kind of concerns could be addressed. And that the majority could get the, what they wanted, which was a strong resolution that would allow BRT to go forward. So that was kind of the nature of the compromise that was worked out. And uh, we proceeded to vote along those lines. Resolution was passed that would allow BRT to move forward, and it is moving forward. We had an event today, I understand, although I wasn't able to attend, uh, where you got to see the bus. I still haven't seen it, so I'm, I'm jealous if you had that opportunity. But then um, I noticed that uh, after the majority and their representatives got what they wanted, that there seemed to be increasing pressure to sort of not worry about that part uh, where, where the minority 
got something out of the agreement and out of the compromise. And I, I'm just not comfortable with that. I feel like we should follow through with the spirit of compromise and the spirit of agreement that made that compromise possible. Reason number three. I think there's value in a second opinion. I agree with those who've expressed that. I like to compare this uh, to major surgery. Provo is the patient. This is a surgery that will have very important benefits. Some would argue that it's indispensable at some point. But it also has impacts. And uh, I'll liken this to a family. Maybe the majority of the family members feel like the surgery is a necessary risk and they want to move forward immediately. But there's a minority of family members that are concerned. They're not completely confident of the diagnosis. They're not sure that the uh, surgery plan is correct and they don't want to take the risk without at least verifying with the second opinion that this is the best plan that we've got available for the patient. So I would support um, appropriating the funds for that reason as well, for, for the value of the second opinion. And I do not believe, regardless of how that comes back, that there will be any effort to delay the project We've given the green light for them to move ahead as quickly as possible, but it may affect the, event the eventual trajectory of, of where it goes in the long run. At least there's a chance that it could. My last and f my fourth and last reason is has to do with healing, and this is. Uh, this has really been a difficult time for, for us as a city, I think, in um, intense feelings. Um, between residents, neighborhoods, even the administration and the council to some extent. Um, well, I think we're making good progress there. I really appreciate the progress we've made there in the last few weeks. But I'd like to read you a quote from Abraham Lincoln that I'll have to uh, thank, I, I believe, both uh, Diane Christensen and Cynthia Dayton. Uh, I'm not sure who posted this first. But this quote refers to a time of war, but it, it kind of seemed to fit a little bit with what's been going on here. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union. When again touched, as surely they will be, and I like this last phrase, by the better angels of our nature. My hope and my prayer, regardless of what my esteemed colleagues decide tonight, is that tonight would mark the night that we start to come together on this and, and pull together and uh, begin that process of healing. I had one other quote that um, I read today that just seemed to fit and uh, along the same line. Um, this happens to be from a, a religious book, but I think it's applicable to any community. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another. My belief, and I'm sure that there's a difference of opinion on this, but my belief is that a reasonable compromise worked out 
between the majority and the minority is the best path forward toward the kind of healing that I hope that we're all looking for. And that is the fourth reason why I would vote to support this resolution. Anyone else? Here to speak to this. Mr. Miller. I, I would like to, and I appreciate Mr. Sewell's comments. Very well stated. And uh, I'm grateful for his his words here. They're very wise. I do um, want to state my opinion that I do believe in coming together. And that is exactly one of the reasons that I am going to vote against this tonight. As Mr. Stuhl, Stuhl stated, I do believe that also that rapid transit is going to come to our city. And I would like to start with Mr. Sewell tonight to have that happen. I'm afraid that I, I'm of the opinion that if we delay this any longer, that we do stand in jeopardy of losing our bus rapid transit here in, in Provo. I believe that bus rapid transit is not like tracks. We have the opportunity to make changes. And at this point, I have faith in um, UTA, in MAG, in, their, in the, their abilities to make those changes that come forward, that to make this a, a, a more effective. As we do a study today, it's going to change in five years. I don't know what BYU is going to do in five years. They changed it four years ago. I don't know what they're going to do today or five years from now to make those changes different. But this is a flexible enough system, I believe, from what I understand, that we can make those changes should they need to be made. I also am concerned about our relationships with our partners. For years and years, we have begged UTA to come and give us in Utah Valley assistance with, the bu with buses, with mass transit. I'm concerned with our, as we hear the bike mass master plan coming forward, our relationship for getting funding for these bike master plans from MAG and their support and helping us getting the funding for that. I'm concerned with the damage that we have done, in my opinion, that we have done to some, with, to some of those relationships as we go forward. I respect very much the idea of a second opinion. I understand where it's coming from. I just don't see that we are going to end this tonight. If the, what if the study comes back different than some people believe it will, the new TA? Then where do we go from there? Have we, have we stopped? Are we going to vote for it anyway? Because we're going, we want it to come. I just, and the fairness of the process that we went through, it was not intended to be unfair. It's just the speed with which we did it made it unfair. It was not illegal, it was not wrong, but it was not a fair process. And I think we all recognize that on the council. And so I have concerns with this funding going forward. I am being consistent with uh, what I've done in the past. And so I apologize to my good friends in the tree streets, but at this point I do believe for the city of Provo it would be best if tonight we could move on. And so I will vote at this time to probably not fund these, this, this study. Thank you. Are there others to comment? Mr. Mr. Mill, before we go, I, again, I, have, I, want to, I do also want to express my appreciation for our council members. We have had many opportunities where we could have really got at each other, and I respect the way we have handled it amongst each other. I am grateful for that and look forward to that continuing on in the future. Mr. Hales. I hope we can continue what we voted last time. Uh, I appreciate all the comments that have been made. First of all, I don't think that there is any delay contemplated in, in uh, voting to have this second opinion done. Uh, we've already given uh, the nod that uh, they, UTA should proceed as planned, and I understand they've been doing that, assuming that Route 4 is the route. So move full speed ahead. 
Uh, we're just going to take a little bit of additional time on our side to make sure that a second group comes, comes in that's well qualified and determines that what UTA has already decided is in fact true. Uh, the criteria is very well defined. Uh, in fact, our resolution stated that using the, the outlined FTA criteria, that's going to be what we look at. So whichever plan best meets the FTA guidelines as weighted by the FTA, that is what we're going to decide to go with, or at least that's what we'll recommend to UTA. I suppose that they can do what they would like to do afterwards, but they stated that their obligation is to do the best plan. That's part of the FTA guideline. They can't submit an inferior plan if something better is known. So again, I feel good about this. I uh, feel like it's important, uh, you know, the point that this is a $150 million project, that we're spending $95,000 to make sure that it's going to be in the best interest of Provo. I think there's a, a good case to be made that that's a smart investment. And so I, for one, am in favor of funding the engineering study as, as uh, indicated. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just um, refer back to one of the points of Mr. Sewell and agree with it that I do believe that the night of that vote there was an understanding that this was somewhat of a package deal. And so my comments are not necessarily to talk you out of, of, of that, but to perhaps urge and inspire uh, the council uh, and the, the consultant to, to stay in harmony with UTA through this process. And that's what's, I think, the purpose of this letter and, and how we should read this letter is um, let's make sure that the course that we take, if this is approved tonight, stays in harmony with UTA as a partner so that when we get to the end of that, UTA doesn't poke holes in the findings um, and, and then we have a, that divisiveness that we're worried about. And as I read these points on here, I, I don't think they're things that can't be remedied. Um, I, I haven't been involved in, in the process, the selection process, but I would I would urge us to, to work with the consultant to see if he can pull himself in harmony with their concerns. And uh, he makes an interesting, none of us have had a time to really digest this letter, but his very last um, comment is that I think he's not retreating from what he said that night here a couple of weeks ago, but actually referring us back to that and saying, now remember, we're looking for significant improvements that would change this route and not trying to undo this route in and of itself, if that makes sense, that the whole purpose is just not to undo this route. And so I think uh, to the extent, and I don't know where this vote's going to go, but if it goes forward, that we, that we really try to stay in harmony with that goal through this process and consider UTA a partner. Thus, when we get to the end, we don't have them asking them to do another study that would counter our study. One thing that I would like to add to, Mayor, is for you to use your influence with UTA to try and get them to be good partners with us, too. I frankly was a little disturbed by the tone of the letter. Uh, I think, obviously, the, the goal is going to be to try to find something that's going to be acceptable to UTA and to come out in criticism of it before it's even been done. I, I just, I wish that UTA were a partner with us in making sure the meeting that we had up at the, up at the Capitol building, uh, Mike Allegra said, we do this all the time, where we have peer reviews come in, and we'd be happy to participate in that process. So I'm hoping that that's their attitude, and I'm confident that it will be. I think they'll be willing to work with us, and we're, we're certainly not out to prove something. We just want information that this is going to be the best thing for Provo. Other comments? Mr. Jones, may I ask your advice on uh, whether you have uh, a suggestion to simply alter Resolution 5 to the $95,000, and then we, if we move to Resolution 6, we would, uh, what would we do there? Well, Resolution 6 it already has the 95000 in it. So the, the, it seems that there's two options. Um, one would be to amend uh, resolution five here tonight to include the $95,000 figure so that it matches uh, resolution six. The other would be to approve both of them 
as they are, knowing that the contract binds you to spend $95,000 and that if, uh, well, it binds you to spending up to $95,000. There is not a predetermined price in the contract. So uh, you could, if you, if you felt necessary to do so, you could appropriate the remainder of the money at some future date. The main issue about whether you do it tonight or not is just a question of noticing. Um, state statute requires that the notice of the appropriation be uh, published 10 days before the meeting, which was done, and at that time, the anticipated figure was 70,000, so that was what was put in the notice. Now, generally speaking, noticing requirements require that the public be put on fair notice of the topic that's going to be discussed. So clearly, the notice that was, that was given to them was that there would be an appropriation uh, today, uh, discussed today, what the purpose of the appropriation was, and a figure of at least $70,000. So the only way in which that becomes a problem is if the change from seventy dollars to $95,000 becomes so significant that it is somehow unfair to the public that they, those who wouldn't have shown up to protest 70000 would show up to protest 95000 is essentially the, 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 um, the, I guess, the test that, that would go into the, making the determination there. So, um, so those are the two options, is to either just amend five and appropriate it all now, um, feeling comfortable that uh, the noticing requirements have in fact been met, or if there's, if there's concern about that, you could appropriate the remainder at another time. So we could uh, simply, uh, earlier you spoke of approving both uh, resolutions uh, with the understanding that resolution six would supersede well, so the point I was trying to make was that if you approve re Resolution 5 with an appropriation for $70,000 and you approve, approve Resolution 6 uh, executing a contract that binds you to potentially spending $95,000, that you're doing it with the understanding that if you end up spending more, 70, more than $70,000 in the long run, you will have to come, but you'll either have to find it out of currently available the difference out of currently available budget or come back with a, another appropriation in the future. I see. Thank you. Let's take uh, 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 item five then, the, uh, the resolution that appears there. And I invite a motion. Mr. Sewell? Are there any other comments? I'm ready to make a motion if they're not. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. You have a comment. I beg your pardon. Well, I've been a little hesitant because I know there's a caucus tonight and I didn't want to take up too much time. Uh, but I do want to say that I appreciate the comments that have been made both by our public and by council members and uh, appreciate this process. I appreciate the opportunity to get a second opinion and hopefully that will be supported. This is something that I feel is incredibly important. Uh, to have the current conditions analyzed and to be able to go forward with confidence uh, whichever way we go. And I, I like this firm, Hales Civil Science and Metro Analytics, because that's their, their, their focus is to uh, make this work. Their focus is how can we make this work. They, they want to get the current data, they want to get the information, but they also have that determination to, if there is something better, if there is a better route, then let's not delay the process, let's not find a way to ruin the project or kill the project, but let's make the, help make the project work. And because BRT is malleable, because it is something that can be moved, they could help us figure out how to, um, a, a kind of a stepping, uh, stepping stones to get it into an alignment that actually works for Provo in the long term. So they have a good perspective on, on what, how they can help us. And I just appreciate the comments that have been made so far. And I, I do have a question about um, just appropriating the 70000 now and then having to come back and appropriate later when, when we could appropriate the whole thing right now. You're, is it mostly that there's a concern for the, the noticing? I'm sorry, I, I need that explained a little bit. Yes. I think. Just, you think that's the best way to proceed is with the seventy? Well, I, I'm, what I'm trying to express is that those are the two options before you. and. Uh, so long as um, 
so long as we feel comfortable that the notice made to the citizens that an appropriation was under consideration tonight and that the change from 70,000 to 95,000 is not so, so significant as to be unfair, then it should be permissible to go ahead and do the 95,000 today. Um, so it, it, it's a judgment call as to the conservative approach, the, the clean approach with where no questions can be asked is to do 70,000 now and the rest later. Um, but so long as so long as the noticing is not unfair to those that have received the notice, it's not illegal to do the entire 95,000 today, and I think that's I think that's defensible. Other questions or comments? So then, to do the whole $95,000 today, would we need to amend uh, item five? Yes. So someone just needs to make a motion to amend. Uh, resolution number five to in, to change the amount from seventy thousand to ninety five thousand. I see. And then item six, Mr. Jones. And item six can pass as is under either scenario because it's uh, currently says the ninety five thousand. Mr. Sewell. Well, I'm I'm really torn here because I I really would like to have this over tonight and not have it follow-on vote to appropriate the remainder, but we have been learning that public perception is important, and so I guess I'm willing to, uh, I, I'll, I'll make a motion to pass it as is with the understanding that we'll come back in two weeks and appropriate the rest of the, of some necessary to fulfill the contract. I second that. Any further discussion? Well, let me invite you a vote then. All in favor? That's uh, Mr. Hales, uh, Mr. Van Buren, Mr. Garrett, Ms. Santiago, Mr. Sewell. Those opposed? Mr. Winterton, Mr. Miller. The motion carries. Now to item six. Mr. Jones, once more, would you weigh in? On item six. On item six. Um, again, item six. So the the only technical legal problem that you have with item six now is that it it binds you to potentially spending up to ninety five thousand um, dollars. But there are, and you've got seventy thousand that you've appropriated. That that isn't all the money that's in front of you. You have um, uh, council budget and other funds that could could be used, and you have the ability to move forward with future appropriations. So I don't see any obstacle to uh, to moving forward with this, knowing that that is the case, with, with each of the council members being fully aware that approving the contract may require more funds than you have currently appropriated. And, and Mr. Sewell's motion that was just approved designated uh, two weeks hence as the time for that uh, further allocation to be approved. Right, and so I would take that uh, for council staff to, to come, to, well, We'll have to coordinate with the administration to make sure that the noticing requirement is met again. Um, but uh, as far as long as the noticing is met for, for two weeks hence and the resolution is drafted, then we, that can certainly come back before the council in the next meeting. Thank you. I invite a motion then to approve uh, items, the resolution in, in item six. Ms. Santiago. I move to approve the, a resolution approving a contract for transportation engineering consulting services to Hales Engineering LLC in the amount of $95,000 and applying to fiscal year ending June 3rd, 2014. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Buren, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Mr. Sewell, Ms. Santiago, Mr. Van Buren, Mr. Hales. Those opposed? Mr. Garrett, Mr. Miller, Mr. Winterton. The motion carries four to three. And now a public hearing on an ordinance amending section 9.14.200 to allow organized fighting contests in Provo City if approved by and in compliance with the Utah Athletic Commission regulations. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Mr. Chair, can I, can I make a motion to continue this item without the presentation? Or should we wait for the presentation? And you cer you certainly can do so. There's no 
reason why you can't do that. Are you making such a motion? I'd like to make a motion to, to amend, to continue this item to either our next council meeting or either the 1st or the 15th. I'm not Shall we say the 1st? The 1st would be fine. In, Given the hour and the caucus. In, and in as much as the presentation was ready for this meeting, so that would seem reasonable two weeks hence. Yes, I think there are some additional questions Mr. Van Buren raised, and we'll discuss those in the leadership meeting. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Sewell, thank you. Uh, all in favor? Vote is unanimous. Thank you. I now call for a motion to adjourn this uh, council meeting. So moved. Thank you. Ms. Santiago? Mr. Second. Garrett? Thank you. All in favor? The vote is unanimous. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.